part of what happens when we d- when we declare anger off limits for ourselves is we turn off an entire swath of our protective life energy. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Now, we don't want you to worry about taking too many notes, so you can join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club, and we'll send you the transcripts and show notes from every episode. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my pleasure to be with you on another episode of the Autoimmune Hour. Oh, my goodness. It is just rolling along. And I am meeting the most amazing people and having awesome return guests too and tonight we have a fan favorite not only one of my favorites but also you guys have been asking to see more of Sarah Payton so uh, (laughs) twisted her arm sort of she's always so generous with her time that's what I just love one of the many many things I love about her we're going to talk about something that we haven't talked about we've sort of skirted around the edges before with a number of people and I think it's really powerful to understand this topic because as you've listened to me on the show before and been along with me on this healing journey, you've found that how much I've seen the emotional part plays into whether we're thriving or not. And I want to earmark this one as this has everything to do with autoimmune and everything to do about our life. So if you've got anybody that wants to listen in on this, assure them that we're going to go way beyond just if you've got an autoimmune, because we're talking about anger tonight. And that's what I'm so excited about, because we're going to talk everything from about what is anger to repressed anger and how it affects us and how to get rid of it. And we're just going to have so much fun with Sarah Payton. She is just awesome. She's one of our favorite, favorite guests, as I said, and she offers healing experiences and for hearing ourselves and others more deeply, she uses precision and, and resonant language, and she's a non-violent communications expert. I think that's how we say it. But she just helps understand what I call 3D body-centered explorations for families over generations, and that's through her family constellation work, plus so much more. She has a well, I won't say new book out anymore. It's been out of winning awards left and right. Your resonant self has been out for a while, and just racking up awards and all sorts of great, great reviews. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show again. Oh, Sharon, what a pleasure to be here. I love our conversations. Oh, I do too. We get so deep. And if you've seen any of our other conversations, our last one was unconscious contracts and sacred vows. I swear my chin was on the tabletop the whole time. I was just couldn't believe how powerfully changing that was. If you haven't seen it pop over to our YouTube channel, Understanding Autoimmune, and check out Sarah Payton's video. The audio is strong, but I'll tell you, watching Sarah do this process of uncovering our unconscious contracts, very powerful on video, which this show is available in both video and audio, depending on how you're listening to it. You can always catch it the other way and get transcripts of it, which I found powerful too, because you could go back and read word for word the languaging that Sarah uses, and you'll find out. Sarah, let's talk about languaging just for a quick second, Mm -hmm. and we'll get into this other work. But let's talk about how come what we say and how we say it's so important. Well, the way that we use words lets our bodies know that we have received their messages, which is important for everyone, but especially important if we're struggling with any health issues. So any kind of health issues have messages that we get to bring warm accompaniment to. And so the way that we use words in connection with ourselves and in connection with our what's happening with our bodies changes the body's sense of whether or not it's being received. So, for example, if you have back pain and we were to say, cells of your back, 
Would you like a little acknowledgement of the daily burden that you carry? Are you working so hard to protect the person that you belong to? And even even that sort of gentle, very general inquiry begins a dialogue that's got um so it goes can go so many places and be so rich. So there's something here that's about the kinds of words we use when we bring words to experience, and there's also something about entering a dialogue, which is quite extraordinary. Oh, absolutely. And that's the deep level work that Sarah does. And I'm just going to hit more of a surface level. You might hear me talk about autoimmune experience or autoimmune journey versus Mm -hmm. the very powerful words of something like, say, I have an autoimmune disease. Mm. To me, those can conjure up very different experiences, even at that very what I would say, I'm going to put in air quotes, very average sort of conversation words. Yes, it's true. Yeah. If you identify yourself as being a being who's having an experience, it's different than identifying yourself as uh, uh, with part of your identity being a a health condition. Very Mm. different. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I always find that so fascinating how we language both externally and internally to ourselves, how that can act absolutely create the experience that we go through. But let's talk about anger. I know there's so many types of different types of anger, it's outwardly anger, that maybe it's directed at one person or a group, or now, goodness sakes, it just seems sort of a general blanket of anger at times when I'm walking around, I almost feel it energetically, as well as anger at ourselves where we uh, inwardly adopt an angry attitude. Maybe we're angry at our body for having this condition or whatever it might be. So where should we start when we talk about this huge topic? Well, the most important place to begin is to begin with an acknowledgement that for some people, they, they have had traumatic experiences with anger, and so they have declared anger off limits for themselves. This is very common with people that have chronic health conditions. And part of what happens when we, when we declare anger off limits for ourselves is we turn off an entire swath of our protective life energy. So a bit of the work of today's call, of today's, uh, today's conversation, is the work of an invitation for a reimagining of the power and importance of anger, a reclaiming of what I like to call clean anger. Often I say, this is anger that instead of anger at. Oh, I love that. To say that, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that we can be angry that we have an autoimmune disease. We can be angry that we suffer from another health condition. It's like, yes, of course we have. I mean, of course we would be angry because it impacts our lives, but as opposed to being angry at ourselves and believing that we are in some way to blame or being angry at the doctors because there wasn't a diagnosis for so many years. Those kinds of angers, anger at the self, anger at others, creates an unresolved loop, an anger loop that never stops. But when we get to go, yes, I'm angry that this has happened, then, then there's a kind of a movement through us. We can, you can even feel it if you imagine into it in this moment. It kind of can come up like a whoosh through the, through the torso and just like, wow, here I am. This is me. I am worthy of protective life energy and protective life force. I matter. My needs matter. Mm. This is a very different way to be with anger than the traditional sort of blame, uh, extreme high energy blame that we often think of when we think of anger. Wow. You always leave me just in moments of profound amazement, my dear. Mm. I love that. Quick question. Uh, I was recently talking to someone I just met, and she described herself as stoic. Mm. talk to her a little bit longer, a little bit deeper. I realized feeling that there was a lot that she was swallowing or holding in 
And is that the type of thing we're talking about that can just come whoosh up? Because she, she was very clear that she was stoic. Uh, well, the whoosh kind of has a, for me, that whoosh, if it's just coming up and out instead of like directed at myself or directed at another person. Yeah, I felt the word stoic yeah. was sort of a stoic. I felt yeah. that was a real directed at me, kind, not me as the listener, but internally. Uh, a way that she somehow kept herself uh, contained. Yes. Oh, and, th and this takes us into our second very important point. And this is that we'll, we'll make contracts with ourselves. This kind of goes back to our work with unconscious contracts and sacred vows. We'll make contracts with ourselves not to be angry because we've experienced tr traumatic expressions of anger where somebody has aimed it at us you know and we've directly had the experience of receiving it Whew, so hard to receive no wonder we would make a contract with ourselves never to go into that kind of expression but the other thing that happens is before we're four months old you and i have spoken of this before about beatrice Beebe's research that shows that before about the time we're four months old we completely internalize what our mother can easily reflect. So if we have a mother who is frightened by anger or who it doesn't really respond to any of our emotions, then we will become stoic. It's a way of um, managing the self by closing all of the emotional doors so that we can be self-managed and, in a way, be small enough emotionally to fit into our family of origin. Our family, every family has its own emotional profile of which emotions are easy to metabolize and which emotions are kept at bay. And anger is often an emotion that is kept at bay. So we may have made contracts around trauma, like I will never be angry because it was so traumatic for me to receive it. Or we may have contracts that are like, I, Sarah, solemnly swear to my essential self that I will never be angry in order to protect my mother from intensity and overwhelm no matter the cost to myself. And this is where our immune system comes in. Because when we have those contracts that say, no matter the cost to myself, then what happens is we end up paying the cost. And we pay the cost in the way that our nervous system responds to life. When we have a sense of being safe and mattering, when we have a sense that our voice matters and that we belong, our nervous system shifts gears so that our uh, immune system is able to be its most effective and complexly responsive self. So when we, sh when we become stoic, because people will become stoic, I mean, this is one of the things that we do in order to survive. The word stoic really speaks to us about a, either a family culture or a national culture that says anger is not okay. Feelings are not okay. They may exist in the subterranean, but we're not going to let them out. Then we're, we're creating a stress on our system, which directly impacts the immune system. It shifts when we're in a state of stress, when we're in a state of fight or flight, which is fear, or alarmed loneliness, the experience of losing someone that is dear to us or having a lifelong sense of just being so lonely. What happens is that our heart is beating a little faster all the time. And the fuel that we're running on is cortisol instead of oxygen. When we have a sense that we're safe and we matter, there's a relaxation, a different kind of breathing. And the nervous system produces the cells that fight cancer, the cells that fight viruses, that create a complex, responsive, fluid immune system response. How is this to hear, Sharon? Amazing. Amazing. How <laughs> so many <laughs> questions came up for me through that. So where, where I'd like to go is I, I'm going to take a quick commercial break right here, guys. It's a little early, but I think that's the best place to stop before I ask my next question of Sarah, which we're going to get into this idea of 
acknowledging that we have this, then what? So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by LifeInterruptedRadio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. We're here with Sarah Payton, the author of Your Resonant Self, and you can find her over at empathybrain.com as well as yourresonantself.com if you'd like to know more about her. But be sure and listen into this because we've got another, oh, about 40 minutes of just amazing, amazing information from Sarah. As you know, I'm just a huge fan of hers. And Sarah, so I'm really resonating with a lot of what you're saying, either for myself or people in my community here at the Autoimmune Hour, people are sort of popping into my mind left and right that I'm going, oh my gosh, they just have to hear this. One of my questions is, if we're resonating with what you're saying, okay, I have shut down, or I am holding this really in, or maybe I do label myself stoic. What are some first steps? Because honestly, it's almost like I get this feeling like, Mm, it could be scary, like I'm releasing a caged tiger or something. What are some of the mm-hmm. first steps that we would do to begin to explore if we're like, mm, something about this is true, but gosh, and that seems a little scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the most important things to do, if we have a sense that it's trauma related, like a sense that there's a, that there are clear memories of anger, is to do our time travel empathy to step through time and space, to freeze the environment in the original experience where there was somebody who was scary in their anger, and to acknowledge what happened for our little bodies in the experience of receiving someone's anger. So if I were to time travel to the little Sarah with uh, perhaps a moment when my mother was angry, then I would make sure to freeze my mother in the memory because it's very interesting about memory. Memory stays alive for us when we when it hasn't been fully processed. We can tell that a memory has not been fully accompanied and understood and metabolized when we have a body sensation that comes with it. So if we think of a mother, our mother, and we think, okay, what if I remember my angry mother, does my body come alive? And in my case, my body does come alive a little bit. It's a, there's a, 
a, a, a deep alarm um, that I can kind of feel, I can like feel this sort of rocking or, or this wave of what it was like to receive uh, the intensity. And so if I freeze my mother, because of course, if she's part of the memory and I don't freeze her, then I just stay in the wave instead of getting to acknowledge it and stop it. So I freeze her. Often when we're working with anger, we put a nice little just towel, tea towel over the person's face so we don't have to see the angry face because this is often the cue for our bodies that something is up. Our faces are, our brains are so responsive to the facial expressions of others. So we cover the mother's face and then we say, we catch whatever's really happening with our, with our younger self. Sarah, is this scary? Do you need acknowledgement that this is scary? And then we listen. Here's another place where we're entering that wonderful dialogue that we begin to move into. So the dialogue is like, is this scary? And the little one says, whew, so scary that I have stopped breathing and I think I've turned to stone. And then we might say, ah, do you need acknowledgement of how deeply you are impacted when someone has an anger reaction? And then you can feel it in your body where you start to breathe. The little one starts to breathe a little bit. I can feel that. Ah, there's a deep breath. And she's like, oh, yes, it's very scary and, and confusing because it never quite seems like it, the anger intensity matches my internal sense of what has happened. I've made an honest mistake or I've, I've been tempted beyond my ability to restrain myself to do so, to eat a chocolate when the back of the mother was turned, you know. I mean, just there's such small things we do when we're three or four years old, right? And so then we invite that little one to come back to present time with us. We say, you want to come with me? You want to not have to live in this particular place before we, this particular place for a longer time you can, we can say to the younger self, we already survived this life. We are grown up. We get to be together. We don't have to live through it again. And then there's a sense of like a gathering. I often have a sense of the little one coming into my heart. And then we check again now. Now that we've done this time travel empathy for the little one who experienced this difficult uh, event with anger, what will we do? When we meet anger now, is it a little easier? So now I imagine myself in present time in relationship with the angry person. And it's not quite so reactive. I'm not quite so reactive. I don't need to flee. I mean, we can flee physically from people who are angry, but we can also flee emotionally from people who are angry. And one of the ways we do that is by getting like really clear. Like, I'm just going to get really clear now. I'm not going to be in a relationship with you about the anger that you're experiencing. I'm going to get to the facts of the matter as I see them. You know, it's just like, <laughs> that, that's a way of fleeing. So maybe I've got just a little bit more space to breathe in relationship with an angry person. But this is about receiving anger, which is different than the question that you asked. You asked a question about if we start to get scared ourselves about the experience of being angry, then there's a different kind of time travel we can also do if we have had moments where we became angry and had a sense that we harmed someone, which is also possible. Well, I'm thinking of, yeah, I'm thinking of the idea of harming someone else or ourselves. How many times I'm thinking that I've heard from people and I can think of a couple situations in my own where it wasn't safe to be right. angry so I swallowed my yeah, anger yeah. and there it sits and <laughs> that idea of you, we can swallow you can bury your emotions but you know you're they'll still be alive <laughs> yeah yeah now we're starting to come to a different kind of acknowledgement so we'll just say Sharon's body do you need acknowledgement that there have indeed been times when anger was not safe mm, absolutely yeah 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 and what happens for your body when we acknowledge that, yeah, it's holding a truth? I actually feel um, a sort of, this sounds weird, my pelvis expanding, widening. Oh, very I, nice. I, I yeah. guess 
it a better yeah, you get to, we get to take up more space yeah when we acknowledge what's true yeah it's sort of in what we'd call my gut area just the hips and the mm. and, and the waist area i just feel it sort of oh, mm. yeah that's that's what it is a kind of a letting an opening yes and the this response of the body points us in such an important direction that we so often believe that our body's not making sense that we so often believe that we have pain or constriction and the, and we're just sort of irritated with ourselves that we have pain or restriction instead of coming to this wonderful place of like, oh, my body does make sense. The tension that it's been holding makes sense. The decisions that my body has made make sense. The decisions my nervous system has made make sense. But now what we want to know is we want to know if your body has a contract with you never to express anger. So it would be, the way we start out by investigating this is to say, is it true to say, I share and solemnly swear to my essential self that I will never be angry? Are we doing okay so far? Um, I want to add, it's uh, never be angry in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of the pattern that we're yeah. touching? Yeah, absolutely. I do. It's family members. Yeah, uh -huh. because uh -huh. I many people will say, "Yeah, she doesn't have a problem getting upset." Right, right, right. <laughs> so I will never be angry with with family members. With certain family members. Yeah. With certain family members, maybe pa family members who have more power. We don't know exactly, but with certain right. family members. Yeah. Now, the next piece of the riddle is in order to. What's the in order to? Keep the family peace. That one uh -huh. came through loud and clear. Oh, yeah. Very strong. To keep the family peace. Yeah, so important for this. Better. Yeah. This is a soul that loves peace. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then the next part of the vow is, we, we, we worked with this before, but now we're specifically looking at anger. No matter the cost to myself. Mm, yeah. Definitely. And that cost is right now what I'm feeling is that, well, right now it's expanding, but before this, it was that tension, that tightness in the yeah. gut area, just holding. Mm -hmm. What part of me wants to say just holding it together? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Sharon Scott, for holding it together. And <laughs> I, you probably didn't see my face, audio people, but when she said that, I just had this tremendous relief mm. completely unexpected my there was a moment there where i think i looked a little shocked on the video <laughs> because i wasn't expect when you said that sarah mm. just that little comment yeah. a little acknowledgement there was a tremendous I, the word the only word that comes to me was kind of physical release ah that's, that's so fascinating isn't it amazing we carry all these messages. Yeah. So just say those words, no matter the cost to myself. No matter the cost to myself. So now here's the next part of this process where we check to see, okay, we made this vow to ourselves. Do we want to keep it? So we say, Sharon, did you hear the vow that Sharon made to you? Mm, Sharon, did you hear the vow that Sharon made to you? Yeah, acknowledging it. And sort of actually tensing up when I said that. Yeah. About the gut, not tightened to where it had been, but I felt sort of this little... Like, yes, this is my <laughs> vow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we ask the next question. Is this a good vow for Sharon? Is this a good vow for Sharon? Well, to be honest there, I, I get sort of an ambivalent answer, or, or is an, a feeling of ambivalence, like maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Not what I was has, expecting. I was expecting it, something more clear and defined. Right, right. Well, let's let's make sure that we're acknowledging what needs to be acknowledged. Would you like a little acknowledgement that it has been really important to keep the family peace? Yes. Yeah. 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 And especially when we're children, it's so important to keep the family peace. Definitely. Yeah. That's. Yeah. I think that's what it was needing to hear. Yeah. 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 Like we get to say to ourselves, oh, I totally understand why you made this vow. Yes, I totally understand. And what was interesting as we were going through those last couple of statements was 
as if I heard a little voice say to me, that's what I needed, just acknowledging mm-hmm. that I wasn't wrong. Yeah. That's interesting. That's an interesting word for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a, like, okay, that's an interesting mm-hmm. word yeah. that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. And so now we'll say, Sharon, would you like Sharon to keep this vow? Sharon, would you like Sharon to keep this vow? No, it's saying there's no need. It's uh-huh. Uh-huh. Saying, then it's just for it to be acknowledged. That's all. Yeah. We'll do the formal acknowledgement then. Sharon, I release you from this vow. Sharon, I release you from this vow. And I revoke this contract. And I revoke this contract. Yeah. And you have my blessing. To say what's true. And you have my blessing to say what's true. And I also have trust in you that you can keep the family peace in new ways that have nothing to do with repressing what's true. And I also have trust in you that you can keep the family peace without repressing what's true for you. What's true for you. Yeah. Oh, that's just delightful, Sarah. Yeah. That's, I don't know how long that took quick, though. You know, yeah. a few minutes. Mm-hmm. What a delightful energetic shift. Mm. Yes, I'm feeling like in a total, I'm actually feeling taller. Isn't that interesting? I don't know why. What, what's happening down there with the pelvis and the belly? How are they doing? Much more relaxed, much mm. more relaxed. I'm, I'm definitely noticing a different sensation. Yeah. And I'm definitely, like I said, I'm feeling taller as if that constriction has elongated somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't physically remember elongating yeah. <laughs> while we were doing the process, but it almost feels as if yeah. the constriction has released and somehow I'm now a little bit taller. I, oh. <laughs> sounds, it's sounding strange to me as I say that, but that's oh. exactly what the body is. As I sort of do a scan, that's exactly how I'm feeling. What a delight. Absolutely. How interesting and amazing is that? Yes. Wow. So now this was very reminiscent of the unconscious contracts. And yes, it's that. the same. Yeah, it's the same work. We're just use it. We're taking a couple different angles. We'll look at another one to another place. We'll find that anger gets involved in the vows next. But uh, yes, we're using this process to think about and let ourselves be specifically begin to reclaim the positive life force of anger. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the positive life force of anger. Because, you know, right now through that process we went, I can see why it was important then. Yeah. And now as an adult, I have more understanding of language, boundaries, triggers, beliefs, knowledge, a great, you know, greater wealth of information to bring to it that the anger doesn't seem like an either or choice to me anymore. It right. seems to be a whole variety of choice yeah. that I can bring to this idea of the whole process of anger. Yeah. One of the things to do to begin to discover anger as a positive life force is to kind of work with it as a meditation. And in order to to work with it in this way, we need to begin to understand and differentiate between what is called predatory aggression and what is anger. So anger, it's easiest to begin to understand anger when we think about infants and how an infant will fuss in the beginning when, like if they have a, if they're hungry and they're not being fed, they'll fuss. But if it goes on for a while, They'll get more and more upset until finally they end up shaking and red-faced with an anger face and they're screaming. And this is not anger at, this is anger that. This is the nervous system and the body saying, this is too much. The baby's body is letting us know there are needs that are very important that are not being met. And when we begin to feel into our anger as an expression of needs that are very important and not being met, we start to exist for ourselves in new ways. We start to realize, oh, this is important to me. This must be important to me because my body is starting to have a response here. 
and we can feel it almost as a heat. And this is a part of what can give us such a clear sense of the link between life energy and life giving anger. Is we can, uh, you, you can take, even in this moment, we could all together take something that many people will blame about. Let's say when you're driving on the freeway and somebody cuts you off and they don't seem, you know, I mean, you have to brake a little bit or a lot in order to deal with their sudden intrusion of their car into your lane. And there can be like a, whew, you start to feel, you know, like a little bit of a furnace, that sound of the furnace or the gas flame catching the, the, the gas jet catching the flame. Whew, you know, you can kind of feel that. And now if you allow yourself to feel it, but allow it to just kind of move out through you and radiate, like to radiate out through your body, radiate out through your shoulders, radiate down through your hips, out through your legs, a sense of, whew, letting it go all the way through you and you can say to yourself, of course I'm angry. I really like it when people have respect when we're driving because cars and speed and cutting in front of people is dangerous. Mm, you know, but the whoosh usually comes out as an expletive. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And expletives are welcome. <laughs> That's a, it's not just outside the. It's not just wishing out the arms and the legs. It usually comes right out my mouth as an right, right. expletive. Yeah, yeah. We'll use the word bleep yes. in case there are there are uh, listeners who are sensitive. But you can hear the difference between, and you can feel it and see it in my body. The difference between you bleep and just the tension, and the tension stays there. You know. And you can, as opposed to bleep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I see what you said. One was very directed at. Yes. Yeah. So this, it's like a, we're claiming our power, but it's a strong and, uh, and careful power. Because we're not directing it at other humans or animals or, or living things that could take harm from our expression. And we're aware that the movement into blame is a movement into harm. Mm, that's wonderful. I like yeah. that because even though I've taught myself to bless those people with this idea that uh, for whatever reason they need to get there six seconds sooner... Yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, an expletive is known to have been coming out even during right after the <laughs> blessing. <laughs> but you're right. I trained myself to understand that you know whatever is happening is happening for a reason. And what was fascinating, just from just a side hole, rabbit hole that Sarah knows I sometimes run down, is one time that was brought very clear to me when a few miles down the road there was a massive accident, not involving the incident that we had, this person and I had just been through, but but it had slowed us down enough that we had both missed that horrific thing oh. we found down the road. And that's where I kind of went, mm, yep, keep blessing that you are six seconds later. Mm. That was a powerful reminder for me that uh, sometimes, and it was okay, because I did have an expletive, not at the person, just like, it was expletive just to release that pent-up energy and yeah, having to slam on yeah. the brakes and everything else. So to me, it's always an interesting process that I love to sort of play mm -hmm. forwards and backwards in my mind of what just happened and was there a, was there a purpose, you know? Yeah. And in this particular yeah. case, I found a very profound purpose. Yeah. I celebrate that you uh, that you are well and alive. Absolutely, I celebrate <laughs> too every every moment. <laughs> and that particular one yeah. had nothing to do <laughs> with uh, anything that I, you know, and that that was sort of one of those surprise moments, shall we say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is fascinating. Let's talk some more about this process that we go through to release the anger that because I th I find that distinction is so profound it really when you said it and I've been thinking about this for the last oh, 30 minutes we've been on the show or so 
that is a profound distinction that absolutely changed the way I look at anger. And I had never thought of that before. We need to take a quick commercial break. I just looked at the clock. When I get with Sarah, I just lose all track of time. And we just blew past that last commercial break there. We'll be right back. And I want to get a little bit more deeply into that distinction of that and at, because that is, to me is as groundbreaking as the time you shared with us, am I safe and do I matter? Those were groundbreaking shifts for me as well. So we'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if? We thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing. So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. We're here with the amazing Sarah Payton, who offers healing experiences about hearing ourselves and others more deeply, understanding the language we use and the precision language and resonant language that can absolutely create profound shifts in ourselves and others. And this has been so fascinating to me. And I alluded to something, and I realized during the commercial break, Some people may not have heard one of our very first interviews, our very first chats, and where you shared this idea of um, that our body sort of has, this is my version, everyone, (laughs) Sarah might want to refine it, but this uh, internal radar going around asking, am I safe and do I matter? And those two profound things created such a shift in the way that I not only enter the world for myself, but how I engage with other people. How can I make this safe? How can I let them know that they matter? Was a profound shift for me. Mm. Now, we've taken it one more notch of this idea of anger that and anger at. So we can Mm -hmm. delve a little deeper into that concept because that is a profound shift as well. Yes, it is a profound shift. And, and a part of what I want to invite, since we, since we was inviting this physical people to imagine it with me, um, just, to, just as you feel into it, you can tell whether you've got an arm that tries to clench in or, that, you know, or, or, or your diaphragm stiffens. Just in, it, th- these are signs that your body has a contract not to express anger and that you can do a little bit of what you and I did to begin to, you know, like the, to speak directly to the diaphragm and see if the diaphragm has a, has a vow to stay very compressed in order to make sure that anger is never expressed. And of course, since we're making these agreements with ourselves, we get to say, oh, I don't want that agreement anymore. You know, it's a very sweet thing to begin to make these unconscious agreements uh, ex- explicit so that we can decide whether or not we want them still. I just wanted to bring that out because people may be, uh, it, it, what happens as we do this work is that we clear our bodies so that our body is agreeing with us to support the anger, that angry, that, you know, to support like a, like a, an, 
an accompanied expression of the importance of our lives. Because that's really what we're being with, the importance of our own lives, the importance of the lives of others for whom we feel protective. Yes, this is powerful, powerful and beautiful life force that we are in relationship with when we move into anger that. And it it helps. uh, I had begun to speak about the differentiation between predatory aggression and and anger. And I talked about the baby, how the baby gets really angry and that that's the rage circuit. We have another circuit that often gets confused with anger, and that is the hunting circuit. It's our doing circuit. But in a particular way, when we want to hurt somebody else, that's a movement into a different circuit. Now, Robert Sapolsky, who I love, speaks about how there's a, an increase in cortisol when we receive aggression from someone. And if we pass the aggression on to someone else, our cortisol decreases. Isn't that amazing? It makes perfect sense. Once you said it, I went, oh, yeah, I can see the flow. Yep. Yep, it's not a flow we want to engage in, no. but it's a flow that it's really important to know about because, of course, it speaks to patterns of bullying. It speaks to workplace aggression. It speaks to the families in uh, family patterns where the, the father is angry at the mother, is angry at the children, is angry at the pet. You know, I mean, it, you, we can see that movement through the, that ripple of violence through families. This is not anger. This is not the movement of anger. This is the movement of aggression, which is different from anger. And we feel the aggression in the angry at. It's a different circuit than the anger circuit. And we, as Western Hemisphere people, have really moved into a diversion of all anger into predatory aggression. As we have anger at, when we move into blame, we, we, we are moving into predatory aggression. The thing about predatory aggression is it's easier than rage. It's easier to get stuck in the loop than it is to, let them, to feel the anger and let it move through. Because the feeling of anger and the letting it move through, we have to be accompanied. It's like our listeners will find it easier to experience this if they imagine you and me with them. Mm. Yeah, if they're not trying to do it alone. If they're like, I'm going to feel the life force of my anger and Sharon and Sarah are going to be with me. I'm going to imagine them standing behind me and saying, yes, you do matter this much. Yes, you do matter this much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need social support to do the complex things that take us out of blame. It takes clear expressions of anger. It takes mourning also, the capacity to hold with sadness what has happened, to be able to accept and mourn the difficult things that happen in this life. It's also very complex, needs support, needs accompaniment. I'd like to just touch on that, too, because we're talking about anger, that, and then we, how there can be blame. And can there also be things like shame and guilt around that as well? Yes, 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 yes. And this brings us towards another piece that I haven't really spoken about publicly, but I really wanted to roll out for you here on this show. Tell me how many minutes I have. Oh, we have seven. <laughs> okay. So Lucky seven. Here's the, <laughs> here's the thing to look for, the thing that's so interesting. We can become very angry at other people. We can move into a place of blame when they take an action that forces us to break a contract that we have. So this is a slightly different way to use and think about the contracts. But let's say we're a member of a group and the group decides to change the time that they're meeting. And the time change that they're meeting, the time change means that we have to change an agreement that we have with our mother, let's say. 
that we have an agreement every Tuesday to have tea with our mother at 10 o'clock. And the group decides to shift to a 10 o'clock start time for their meeting. And they inform us of this, and we become so angry. And the reason that we're angry is not because they shifted the time and didn't tell us. The reason that we're angry, we may feel into it and discover, is because we have a contract with ourselves never to change any agreements with our mother. And so there's a, there, we're being put in a situation where we have to decide between a group that we love and taking an action that we have an agreement with ourselves never to take. And this is such an interesting place to begin to hold ourselves with compassion and to discover what's here. So as we become angry at, one of the questions is, how has this other person and their action or these other people and their action put me in a position where I now have to break a contract with myself? in order to adapt to this new set of circumstances? Very interesting question. Very. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, can, we can go back to the car and the person who's, who's breaking in. We may have a contract with ourselves to drive so safely that no one who's in our car would ever be harmed. And the sudden intrusion of this and the putting on the brakes puts us in a position where this very precious contract to ourselves now has been broken. So it's not the breaking that we're angry at. There's a, there's, there's a sense of anger at the danger, but the real sort of gut-twisting, toxic anger is because life has now put us in a position where we're breaking a contract that's very precious to us that we've made that may be an undoable contract. And this is what's so important, is that tagline on these contracts, no matter the cost to myself. We often have these do no harm vows that are impossible. It's impossible to both be alive and be completely innocent. We cannot live in this world without without shouldering our responsibility for the, our carbon footprint, for the way that our lives impact others, for moments when we lose attention and someone gets a paper cut or someone's hand, a little children's hands can be slammed indoors. I mean, there are all these ways in which people that we feel deeply responsible for can experience harm. And that causes us to be out of integrity with these very important but not truly livable contracts that we have with ourselves. Is this making any sense? Absolutely, because I I flash back to several of those times when you accidentally, (sighs) just by losing attention, something happens. Or your attention is focused somewhere else all of a sudden. Right, right. There is an unexpected consequence on somewhere else. Yeah, and then you're left with this sense of horrible shame. Like it's unforgivable sometimes. We find it so difficult to forgive ourselves for these actions that have happened. And this, is, this begins to bring together the, a confluence, a convergence of shame and guilt and anger. That anger at, anger at self, anger at others for broken contracts, contracts which are in their essence not livable. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is so profound. We're going to have to have you back, Sarah, because we're out of time. (laughs) Oh, dear. Everyone. Oh, my gosh. I hope you've gotten so much out of this. And we'll have Sarah back soon because this is so profound and really want you to contemplate this idea of what contracts do you have. And even this expansion of the idea of the contracts that you make with yourself about life in general Mm -hmm. because we in the unconscious contracts and sacred vows episode we had talked more specific about having something or someone that we could label yeah but here we're expanding that to an even different realm and oh my gosh Sarah this is so impactful I encourage everyone to get the transcript because you're going to be highlighting and underlining but Sarah before we run out of time tell everyone how to get a hold of you and where to find your amazing book oh the book can be purchased online at Barnes and Noble or at Amazon Your Resonant Self by Sarah Payton P-E-Y-T-O-N and the two websites are empathybrain.com 
and yourresonantself.com. Your Resonant Self has a little movie trailer that has some animation that I love that's about these concepts. Uh, and that's how you find me. Thank you, Sharon, so much for asking. Oh, my gosh, Sarah, we are out of time. We're going to have to have you back. This is just awesome. So many things to ponder. I just love when we get together and you expand my mind beyond belief. So many things for me to ponder that idea of anger at, anger that, and uh, oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Everyone will have her back because as you see, kind of left me in mid pondering here. So we'll have her back soon to just, we'll go deeper into this and get the transcripts over at understandingautoimmune.com. And when we have her back, we'll be able to uh, ask specific questions. So leave some comments on her show page there at understandingautoimmune.com too. So we know where we're supposed to go after this amazing hour with Sarah Payton. And everyone have a great weekend, whatever your adventures, and join me next Friday for a brand new episode. Join us over at YouTube, Understanding Autoimmune as well. And you can also join us on social media. So just look up Understanding Autoimmune on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram is where we are. <laughs> just to keep track of all of it. It's crazy. Anyway, everyone, as I said, have a great weekend and enjoy. The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. <laughs>